Welcome to Cross the Line. My name is Charlie Collicker, and my co-host here is Oliver Rednall. And uh, joining us today, a man who's probably seen more films than 99% of the population of mm. Earth, uh, we've got Craig Lapper from the BBFC. Today. Hi. Hi. So, um, Craig, you've been working for the BBFC for about 23 years now, or something like that. Yeah, right? coming on for 23 years now. Wow. And how did you get involved? Um, in well, it's a long and probably not very interesting story, but I actually started off working in admin at the BBFC. Okay. Um, and then uh, I was the BBFC receptionist, believe it or not, for a year or so, and then just gradually moved into other, other areas of the BBFC. So I started working for our... Uh, um, director at the time, James Furman, mm -hmm. who a lot of uh, a lot of people remember, yeah. either with or without affection, depending on your perspective. And then uh, gradually moved on to working in policy, and then working in examining or compliance, as we now call it. Okay. Um, so yeah, I've been there a very long time. And is um, your your head of compliance at the I'm moment? I'm head of compliance yeah. at the moment. Yeah. And is that just the position of? Um, making sure that what everyone else has done, how they've rated something, goes with the guidelines of what is? Yeah, there are a number of aspects to the role, but the key role is I'm the person that the compliance officers who view the films submit their reports to. I have a look at the reports. If there's anything they want me to look at, I will have a look at it. If there's anything in their reports that I think, oh, I should have a look at this, I will do that. But another part of the job is also looking at films at an early stage for advice. So it's usually me or my colleague Sarah who will go along to you know, Warner's, Universal, Sony, whoever it is, to have an early look at a film if they're looking at obtaining a particular classification. Mm. So you know, they might have something they think is a bit borderline, they want to make sure it hits the right audience and they want to get, let's say, a 12A. So I'll perhaps go over and see a rough cut of the film, let them know what they're on track for and any changes that they should make to get the get the rating they're after. Sure. When um, your team submits something to you, mm -hmm. how is there a very, very rare occurrence where you disagree with something that they've said or no, I don't think this should be... It doesn't happen a no. lot. And I think the main reason for that is the decisions we make are based on the classification guidelines. And of course, those are on the website distributors know it, certainly British film makers know about it, so it means that in most cases films fit fairly easily into a category and the compliance officers, rather than um, expressing their own view about what we should do with something, they're looking at it in terms of what the guidelines say, is this a 12, is it a 15 or an 18. That said, of course, there are always borderline cases and it's those kind of cases that would come to me to have a look at. It's unusual for two compliance officers to come to a different recommendation but it does happen occasionally in those cases either I'll have a look at it or in, in, in some cases we might ask more compliance officers to look at it so that we get a range of reports and views. Surely that has to be quite a specific uh, case then what mm. can you give sort of an example of where that might be would it be something yeah. about like violence maybe that you know it's sort of there might be more how graphic it is or yeah it's um violence tends to be relatively easy to deal with because okay. the lines are quite clearly drawn mm. there it tends to be more where an unusual issue comes up um or whether there's in cases where there's wider contextual issues that you have to take account of one case we had not so long ago was a french animation called my life as a courgette okay um, oh that came out and had um didn't they do a, a, a dub for it as yeah, well? Yeah, there was a, there was a was subtitled like... version and a dub version. Yeah. We had to watch both of them. Um, the uh, compliance officers uh, split on the decision. So one of them said they thought it was a PG. One of them thought it was a 12A. And the issue there was um, it's about kids. It's a sort of stop motion an animation. But it's about kids who come from, shall we say, difficult backgrounds, who perhaps experienced abuse uh, in the past, and the central character, whose nickname is Courgette, mm -hmm. um, is a character who's accidentally killed his mum, so he ends up in this home with other children. One way of looking at it is that the, um, the way the film deals with those issues could be quite challenging at PG, you know, mm -hmm. because it's unusual to have references to domestic abuse, um, child abuse at the PG classification. So one of the compliance officers felt that it, we should maybe be cautious and give it a 12A. The other compliance officer felt that the film had a lot of merit for younger kids, especially for younger kids who'd experienced similar things in their own life. So they both wrote reports with quite long arguments about why I think it should be a PG, why I think it should be a 12. So that was a good example of a case where you've got an unusual issue. The guidelines don't really help much because they're not that detailed. 
Um, so it went round to be seen by several other people, including me and the board's chief executive. And with that, would you kind of err on the side of caution or something? Would you usually well, give it a higher rating? Well, it, just it, to... it varies. It depends. If we think a film is dealing with something in a responsible way, a way that has merit, you know, perhaps educational merit, and we think it's dealing with an issue in a sensitive, reassuring way, which ultimately we felt was the case with Courgette, um, we would tend to err less on the side of caution and try to ensure that the film reaches its audience and reaches the widest audience it can hmm. if a film is um, shall we say dealing with a sensitive issue in a less sensitive hmm. manner then yes we probably sure. are on the side of caution that makes sense so when um, because 12a is just a cinema release mm -hmm. right so when that would come out on DVD would it then go to 12 or would it go to PG Oh no, it would go to 12. It would go to yeah, 12. Yeah, I, I'm 12A, 12 are essentially the same category. Okay, yeah. And most of the time, if something's a 12A at the cinema, it'll be a 12 on yeah, video. 12. The only reason we don't call the 12A, 12A on video is because it's not really clear what it would mean. Okay, you know, yeah. At the cinema, it means you can take a kid in, but they have to be with an adult, mm -hmm. but you can't really enforce that on video. No, so, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, obviously, this is for cinema and mm -hmm. film and all that. Um, but the BBFC also does things like video games and stuff like that as well. No, we we don't, we don't uh, do video games anymore. We anymore, do, um, we do cinema features, including documentaries. We do cinema trailers. We do anything that has to come out on DVD or Blu-ray, um, and we also, on a voluntary basis, regulate online content for you know platforms like Netflix. The BBFC did used to regulate video games, but that's now done by the Video Standards Council, who operate the Pan European Games Information System, the PEGI system. So when you go to buy a game in a shop, you'll you'll see those um, rectangular twelves, yeah. yeah. sixteens, and eighteens. But that's that's a separate body now who do that. That was a question I was going to ask because mm. it, obviously they are different symbols, mm -hmm. and the symbols have changed over time, haven't they? From yeah, uh, um, you used to have X or A yeah, in the past, right. and all that. Yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. That's quite the, yeah. It, because the board goes back such a long way since 1912 the categories have changed over the years when the board started we only used to have um, two classifications there was a U which broadly means the same as the U now mm -hmm. so that's the one category that survives an A uh, which has changed its meaning over the years but tended to mean that it had more adult stuff in it and perhaps kids should be accompanied to the cinema um, problem developed over the years that there wasn't really a category that excluded children altogether um, the board experimented with a quite funny sounding category back in the 1930s called the H for horrific, oh, right. which uh, which meant that, you know films like some of the Universal uh, monster movies, you know Dracula, Frankenstein films. Some of those were rated H, and that meant that the BBFC felt it wasn't suitable for children. And was that like specifically for horror movies? It was specifically for horror films, yeah. and that was one of the limitations with it. I mean, like, then, would you use that for like a Tarantino movie or something? Well, Is it like... yeah, I mean, it, it would be quite funny to bring the H back. Hmm. Uh, but because it just applied narrowly to horror movies, but there were other types of films that perhaps wouldn't be suitable for kids, that's where the X eventually came from. I remember there used to be UC. Yeah, there when was, I was growing up, it was yeah. like, especially suitable for yeah. everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I didn't know, Is that still going? No, we don't use the UC anymore. Um, the point of the UC was to indicate that something was suitable for all, which means it's you, but that it was particularly <coughs> the kind of video that you could leave a kid alone to watch on their own. You know, so we're talking about very simple preschool kind of material. The problem with it is um, some children's material might be fine to leave kids to watch on their own. But there might be older kids, or even you know, if, if it's a Disney film or something, adults who want to watch it. So it was a bit restrictive. And because we gave distributors the chance to say, do you want your film to be a U or a UC? We found that most of the time people were going for U. So, so it effectively became redundant. Sure. Um, do you feel now that, because what we're seeing on, in film now, at the 18 and 15 and 18 level, is mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot more violence. We seem to accept a lot more things mm. that we watch. I mean, years ago, something like Straw Dogs was banned. But when I watched that, I, I was quite surprised at, by today's standards, it wasn't as severe as what we mm. may say in something like a Tarantino film yeah. or, um, or something like that. Do you feel that we're at each end of the level, like we're becoming more sensitive at a younger age, so we might categorise something like Star Wars now as a PG rather than a U, mm -hmm. but then at the other end, uh, things are sort of slipping through the net, which they once wouldn't have done. Well, I think um, I think standards have changed in a number of directions. I think people are more sensitive now about stuff for younger kids, so it's probably right to say there are lots of U films from years ago that wouldn't get a U now. Um, in terms of the stuff at the 
um, upper end of the category. It's inevitable that public attitudes change with time. There could be a number of reasons for that. You know, the influence of the internet, social media, all kinds of things influence um, public views in terms of acceptability. Um, but um, m you know, m m more generally, the, what the board tries to do is monitor what the public are thinking at any given time and, and uh, write the guidelines in accordance with that. Whether people are more tolerant of violence, I think they're, they're more tolerant of certain types of violence like action violence, fantasy violence. They're perhaps less tolerant when it's sadistic or sexual. Um, and, and, and you do see changes happening over time. So whereas people get more relaxed perhaps about bad language than they used to be, they're becoming less relaxed about discrimination. So, there, so it is a sort of two-way street. It's not just a matter of people becoming more liberal on everything. I mean, yeah. on, on, on straw dogs, um, although visually it's not that detailed. The reason straw dogs was uh, withheld on video mm -hmm. Uh, for a number of years wasn't so much the visual detail it was because of the way that central sequence works yeah, yeah, sure, sure. and the suggestion that you know the, the the reaction of the woman in the scene moves from resistance to acceptance that's right yeah, yeah. and i think uh, at the time the board's concern was very much that um, some people might take the wrong message from that you know in terms of reinforcing rape myths so that was that was the key problem I see dogs. so it wasn't the shootouts <clears throat> and the, the blood no, or anything like that it was more no, than one no. specific all, scene all those right. things of violence and mayhem at mm. the end of straw dogs um, weren't a problem for the board even back in the 1970s uh, when when it was past X for cinema release uh, it was really the uh, the sort of mixed messaging in the central scene of sexual violence mm -hmm. yeah. okay yeah um, you, you mentioned a second ago that uh, Obviously, times change, people's mm. tastes change, and mm. all that kind of thing. Mm. Does that cause you to? Because I'm aware that certain films have then been re-rated, yeah. as it were. How mm. do how do you go about doing that? Do you have like a time limit where a pop up mm. will come on and you go, "Song of the South"? I've got to change that. Got to no, we don't. Um, the way it works is it's up to a distributor to send it in again. Um, okay. You know, for us to reconsider a rating, they need to submit it again. We need to examine it afresh. Obviously, there's uh, you know hundreds of thousands mm. of films out there and we can't spend our time you know dipping into the archive and saying oh I think I'll have a look at this yeah. you know this category might be a bit out of date um, so it does mean that you get some films that got an 18 30 odd years ago and they're still 18 it's probably just because we haven't looked at it by the same token if somebody sends in an old film now because they're re-releasing it in cinemas or they're re releasing a new version or they're putting it on blu-ray um, we will have another look at it and we'll give it the most appropriate category today. And it might be that the category is, needs to be higher. I think Jaws is probably the best example mm. of that. Cause, it was a PG, wasn't it? Yeah. Or, I don't know if it was a 12 yeah. film, was it? Yeah, that's right. It was a, you know, a back in the 70s and then PG on video. Of course, that was at a time when we didn't have a 12. So we had to decide, um, are we going to keep Jaws at PG or are we going to make it a 15? And it's such a well-known film, 15 seemed like an overreaction. But when it came in for its cinema release, we thought there's absolutely no way we can pass this at PG mm -hmm. by modern standards. Mm -hmm. um, but perhaps that's more to do with the way the category systems change than just public expectations. Because mm -hmm. I remember when Goldeneye came out, that was a 12, and when they released it on DVD, I believe I read it was something like some additional headbutting scenes that yeah. brought it from a 12 to a 15. Yeah, yeah. I think um, without looking it up, I, I think some of those Bond films, they might have had some edits made mm. to ensure that they hit the right category at the time, and sometimes what you find is then when they bring them out, um, you know, years later they reinstate the material that was originally cut, mm -hmm. so, so that would probably explain why that would have gone up to 15. Yeah, yeah. I see, yeah, no. I mean, I was saying to Charlie the other day, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves was a mm -hmm. film I grew up with, mm. and I always thought at PG, now looking back on it, it's quite a violent film, it is. there's quite a lot, uh, mm. you know, and other things going on there as well, as well mm. as bad language, but mm -hmm. I think that's gone up to a 12 now, because my friend bought it recently, yeah. and he said, oh, it's a 12 now, and I was like, yeah. oh yeah, so that, that is something, would that the distributor have sent that to you again? Again, you know, what what I said about Jaws, that we, there was a period where the board had PG and 15, but we didn't have 12, but the Americans had introduced this category called the PG-13 category, oh, yeah. and I think part of the uh, reason for that was dealing with those harder edge PG films, things like Temple of Doom, but those kind of movies, which caused a lot of controversy in the States. Mm. But it did mean for several years, um, when you've got a film that was PG-13 in the States, the company here would be desperate to avoid a 15, so they'd end up having to cut the film in order to get it down to PG, um, whereas now we, you know, we've got the luxury of having the 12A and 12 category in the middle. But yeah, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, 
it had I think it had one one F word in it, quite a bit of violence. Um, it was cut um, to remove the F word and some of the violence on film. A lot of people didn't think the board had removed enough, mm. and then when it came on video, some more edits were made. But of course, now you can see the full version at twelve. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Interesting. So things like the sort of franchise movies like Star uh, Star Wars and. Mm. And the Marvel films are they? They're all sort of trying to hit for a twelve, aren't they? Yeah. At maximum because of yeah. obviously the the box office effect. Yeah, and I, I I think sometimes people say, well, why are all these films uh, being designed in order to get a PG thirteen in America? And I think the answer to that is, um, with certain types of films, if they come out as an American PG, it can put off uh, teenagers from watching the mm. film because they think it's a bit young. A, <laughs> they think it's a kids' film. So you do tend to get companies, and they're, they're very adept at this now because they know what the rules are, will make the film in such a way as to get a PG-13 in America. And a lot of the time, if it's for violence, it will end up as a 12A here. Um, sometimes if it's to do with tone and threat, we take a slightly stricter view than the Americans, so it might end up at 15. But um, you know, th this, this desire to get the film to the right audience uh, does lead to some odd things where companies will sometimes throw something into a film just to make sure they hit that category. And I think the most uh, the, the most well-known example of that is the single use of strong language that you can have in America in a PG-13. So you'll often find a film that would otherwise be PG, but at one point somebody they use just a has word. to shoehorn in a certain really? word <laughs> I did to not make know sure that. they get the right rating. Oh, right. Yeah, we, we call it the PG-13 F word. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so they're allowed one word, one use of I it? Think, I think that... they're now a bit more generous, and I think you can have a couple of uses in America now. Oh. The board's a bit more flexible. You can have slightly more strong language than that, but obviously with a lot of films being made in America for American audience, they've made it with the PG-13 well, in mind. Well, that makes sense, because we, we were talking about Marvel just a second ago. Mm. Go, and you have films like Guardians of the Galaxy, for yeah. instance, in which Rocket mm. is quite a, um, mm. uh, it, it says quite a lot mm. over the course of the film, mm -hmm. a lot of which is uh, either rude, derogatory, yeah. or uh, yeah. swearing, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And it's one of those I remember seeing with friends and thinking, there, there's quite a lot of bad yeah. language in this yeah. movie for yeah, yeah, yeah. its rating. Yeah. And th that would make sense it's seeing It's just a guarantee that nothing unexpected happens and the film gets a PG. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, you, you mentioned working. Uh, or that the Americans have slightly different mm. uh, standards. Does mm -hmm. that mean you can sometimes have an, a British version of a movie and an American version of a movie, mm -hmm. or are they generally the same? It's, it's, it does happen. Um, it's fairly unusual now because it's just a lot easier if they have the same version everywhere. Mm. There's always um, a risk as well if a film's been edited in, in the UK to get a lower rating here, it might put off some of the audience going to see it at the cinema. Mm. So I think with certain types of film, they just wouldn't do it. So something like um, you know a Star Wars film, they, they you know they, they know what category they need in America and Britain. They're going to work to to get the right category, and there's not going to be a problem. But very occasionally, you will find a film um, where uh, perhaps it's got an R rating in America, and they desperately need a 15. And and if the changes that have to be made to the film aren't too severe, then they might make those changes. So something like Brightburn. Oh yeah, example, last year. Oh, yeah, yeah, and that was another film that we went to see for advice, um, slightly before it was finished, because they were worried whether it was on track for a fifteen or not. Already got an R in America, and there were a couple of sequences there that just lingered a bit too much on infliction of pain and injury. Uh, sequence with a shard of glass in an eye, which was pretty toe curling. Is it, is it one of those um, where you go, you just need to cut back three seconds? Yeah, off we, the you know, we, we, th that's the thing we don't want to do. We never want to go in there and decimate a film. Sure. We, we always want to work with the company or, or sometimes with the, the filmmakers to ensure that any edits that are made work smoothly so that the film's not damaged. And if we think the narrative of the film's going to be damaged, we'll always say, look, you know, we don't think cuts can solve this problem. You're just going to have to stick with the higher category. But with something like Brightburn, it was relatively easy to take some sequences out, um, uh, take parts of a couple of sequences out, and still end up with fairly effective scenes, but just ones that weren't going to uh, make people run out of the cinema. I'm quite surprised that America is uh, more accepting than England is. I thought they'd be a bit more conservative in what they show. Or is it, does yeah. it vary on, the, on, on it, what it, it is? It varies according to issue. <clears throat> they're, um, they're, they're probably a bit more relaxed than we are about violence. They're probably slightly less relaxed than we are about sex, um, and that does mean that sometimes a film can be edited in America to get an R rating, um, whereas it will sail through with a 18 or even a 15 rating here. 
uh, a lot of the problem there is that uh, in America they have an NC-17 rating above the R rating. Well, what's the NC-17? Um, well, you know the R rating means that yeah. under-17s must be accompanied, and generally an R-rated film in America would tend to get a 15 or an 18 here, depending on the issues, but they do have this category NC-17 that means no children can come in. Okay. The problem with that is the majority of cinemas, and certainly chain cinemas and cinemas in shopping malls, just won't show NC-17 films. Really? So it's really important, unless you're releasing a really small indie film, uh, to get that R rating. So you will sometimes find sexual content being taken out in America, but then the film can be released intact in the UK. Mm. Can you, what examples have you got of an NC-17? Um, NC7 Blue is the Warmest Colour was a film that got uh, NC17 in the States, which the distributor wasn't too happy about. Um, but there have, there have been other examples further back in the past. Uh, Showgirls, probably the least reputable example. Um, but um, things like American Psycho, oh, that yeah. was an NC17. Um, yeah, so a variety of films with sex scenes sometimes go too far right. for, for the US board to put in the more commercial categories. Yeah, because I can imagine that. That was very graphic and it sort of mm. merged various mm. things at once to, mm. to, to, to show that. Yeah. You know, I think in Australia, when the book came out of that, they wrapped mm -hmm. it in cellophane mm. so people couldn't read it in a shop. Yeah, yeah. Is that true? I don't know. I've read it, mm. so it must be. <laughs> it must be true. <laughs> that would be mental if that's the case. Um, so do you, uh, obviously... The BBFC is the British version. Mm -hmm. um, do you work quite closely with the Americans or Australians when it comes to... Yeah, we, we, we talk to a variety of regulatory colleagues around the world. We do talk quite a bit to the MPAA because obviously the majority of films are coming from the US and, and, and may well have an American rating before us. Um, but we do also have quite close contacts with the Australians, the New Zealanders, also a lot of our colleagues across Europe. Uh, and the, everybody tends to get together once a year somewhere around the world to, to have a meeting, look at a film and discuss where we all are and ways that people might be able to work together. So think, you'd all watch like a yeah, movie and say yeah, how you'd yeah. rate it? And so you know how this country rated it, how this country rated it, maybe have a discussion about... Uh, Which was know, the one you watched last time? Oh, I, I, to be honest, I can't remember. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. I watched so many movies. I, yeah, <laughs> Just exactly. Just, um, how, often, how many movies do you find yourself watching in, say, a, a week? Or so? um, well, because of the nature of my job, I tend to watch a few films in full, but I watch a lot of sequences from other films and videos that are referred to me. I mean, it's kind of hard to put a figure on it because in a week I might go and see... You know, a couple of films for advice, see a few films that are on the borderline or that have been referred, but I'll also spend an awful lot of my time looking at sequences in films and videos that people have asked me to look at. Do you ever go to the cinema in your I spare time? I do go to the cinema, yeah. All people, right. are, people are sometimes surprised that, not just me, but the compliance officers go to the cinema. We, we, we all tend to do it. I try, I try to go to the cinema at least a couple of times a month usually to catch up on anything that's come through that's interesting that I just didn't see, um, but also because it's quite interesting to see how an audience would react to a film and, you know, to see it with an audience. Because in a sense, when we're doing our job, we're doing it in a slightly artificial way. Although we do watch the films on the big screen and we have a preview theatre in our building, um, you, you don't get that kind of sense of how other people are reacting and engaging. So it's quite useful from that point of view. So if you're with friends and they go, oh, do you want to hang out? Uh, let's chill out, let's go to the cinema or something. Yeah. You don't see red at that moment. No, no, oh, I've seen no, all no. of them. And, you know, it's nice <laughs> to be able to sit through a film and just enjoy the film for itself because um, obviously when we're viewing a film, we're sitting there with a laptop mm. open and we're typing notes as we go along of everything that's happening in the film. So it's good to be able to put that to the side and just uh, sit back and enjoy it. Although you can't help. And, you know, when you're watching a film, thinking, "Oh, well, that's second F word." Mm. Uh, you know, you, you just. Do I was going to say, is it is it easy to turn off when it's, you're watching, or to an extent, just yeah. because you're not physically doing the report, but you, you just can't get it out of your mind, mm. and then you know you end up coming out at the end thinking, "Oh yeah, I you know I agree with that," or "I think that was a bit questionable," or something like that. But do you get many? complaints from the, the public? We get fewer complaints than people like Ofcom or the BBC. Um, I think the reason is that uh, TV, to an extent, probably less true now, uh, people feel they have less say over what they're going to watch, so people are more likely to be surprised by something and then write in, whereas uh, if you're going to the cinema and uh, investing in one or more cinema tickets, you will probably have done at least some research into what the film is yeah. and have some kind of idea. <coughs> So I think the fact that cinema goers are a bit more self-selective cuts down the number of complaints. That said, we do get complaints normally 
every year there's one or two films that generate um, a handful of complaints, but it's 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 unusual for us to go above double figures with complaints. Really? Um, yeah. Are well, there any movies which you feel have been? I don't know, rated badly, or you would disagree with the rating? Not, not by no, you, of no, course, no. no. Yeah, yeah, no. They're, they're perfectly they're done, all of those. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the interesting thing about public complaint or feedback, as we as we call it, is um, it does give you an impression if you, if you think, uh, if, if the public think that there's a decision out there that, that was on the cusp and that perhaps the board's gone the wrong way. So it's quite useful for us to know about that. And when we do get that kind of feedback, we keep a note of it, uh, publish details in our annual report. And then when it comes to asking the public uh, next time around, do you think the guidelines should be adjusted? We'll tend to show focus groups those films that have provoked the complaint. Um, I, I, I think in most cases, it's either a film where somebody's expectations have been slightly um, well, let's say not met, mm. uh, perhaps because of advertising or trailers. Um, so is that the actual content of it? So yeah, it's just but, not you know, as so good as they expected. Kind yeah, of thing. It, yeah. It, exactly. Something like I don't know, Miss Peregrine or that, where the trailer suggested it was some sort of kooky, fantastical film, which it is on one level, but on another level, it's quite it, it dark. Quite misses that. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So people might think, oh, well, you know, I'm familiar with Tim Burton mm. from the trailers. I think it's going to be about a bunch of children with magical abilities, but it, but it was a bit darker than that. So sometimes people's expectations can be confounded. But then there are other cases where the board has made a decision that's genuinely on the cusp, get a bit of feedback, and then you have to go away and have a think about it. And, and probably the decision that caused the most complaint, and I, I have some sympathy with, was the woman in black. Um, the woman in black, we did pass it 12A after making some cuts, uh, but we did get a lot of people writing in about that. Um, part of the problem with it might have been that it was Daniel Radcliffe and it was coming fairly soon after the end of Harry Potter, Potter films, and all that you know so that that probably didn't help in terms of it attracting people who were too young but a lot of people did feel that it was just too scary the the, the, the scary scenes were too protracted too intense and that's probably a decision that we would make differently mm. uh, if we saw the film now. Because when I remember when Batman Returns came out, they did like a, mm. a campaign with McDonald's for like the figurines mm. and stuff, and kids were like on the adverts playing with yeah. these toys, and then it comes down, it's a fifteen, and it's you know yeah. quite quite violent, quite yeah. graphic, and, yeah, yeah. and quite scary in places. Yeah, that's another example of where um, things happening external to the film and something the board doesn't really have any control over can lead people towards expecting the film is going to be. A particular classification, then it turns out the film doesn't quite match that. I think the first um, Sam Raimi Spider Man was a good example of that because uh, at the time the board didn't have a 12A, we just had a 12, which was a hard category nobody under 12 admitted. And they obviously were starting to market the film to kids, you know, with figures, with lunch mm. boxes. So you've got all these kids at primary school looking forward to seeing Spider Man, they're massive Spider Man fans. And then the film turns up and it's really violent in places. I mean, when we saw Spider-Man, we were sort of discussing in terms of, is it okay at 12? Because some of the sequences had some really impactful blows and violence. I was about to say, I was yeah. seven or eight when yeah. it came out, yeah. the original Sam yeah. Raimi oh, one. Okay. So and, yeah. But I, I remember uh, going in <coughs> and what I expected of Spider-Man was mm. very different to the mm. actual, like mm. watching Green Goblin yeah. drive his glider yeah. into Spider-Man. It's exactly. like, oh, yeah. what's going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Or, you know, if you compare, I don't know, 1960s Batman to Christopher Nolan Batman, you know, they're both Batman, but it's, it's very not the different. same at all. Yeah. So, yeah. Because I remember the, the Robin Hood film with Errol Flynn was a 12. Mm. I remember seeing, and I was like, crikey, but the, the Kevin Costner one is a PG. Mm. And I thought one was made in the 30s and is a lot mm. tamer than this one, so mm. I always wondered wondered about that. Has um, I was reading an article recently about Stranger Things and how the use of smoking, mm. was, has that affected things? Because I've got a DVD of, I think it was Churchill, yeah. with, yeah. and it said contained scenes of smoking on the back. Yeah. And I thought that was quite a new thing to include. Is that something yeah, we, we, you, we, you're we, we, to look out for? Yeah, we, we, we've been doing it for a few years. We do get feedback from pressure groups, obviously anti-smoking pressure groups, who from time to time have come to the BBFC and said we think all films with smoking should be rated 18 to keep them away from children. Um, the board's reaction to that has always been um, we don't want to be disproportionate and you know giving 101 Dalmatians and an 18, 18 <laughs> ludicrous and we're not really convinced the public would, uh, would agree with that. Nonetheless, because the issue has come up a few times and it continues to come up we, we, we do, or we have in the past, asked the public, 
how concerned are you about smoking in films? And generally, the level of concern is pretty low. And we find it's one of the classification issues people aren't that bothered by. And they certainly don't want us to put the ratings up artificially. Nonetheless, because it's the kind of thing people might want to be informed about, especially in films of the junior categories, um, if it's a significant feature of a work, and if it's a significant feature of a work in particular that's likely to have appeal to children, we will flag it up. Uh, but it's certainly not an issue that we uh, we want to overreact about. I was going to say because you can see people in the street smoking. It's yeah, not like it, you know violence yeah. is every day no, or anything like no. that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, because Netflix was saying it was it was of the time because it's yeah. in the eighties. It was yeah. fair for them to yeah. have uh, to have included it in there as authenticity. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and and as you said, you know, making a, a Churchill film and he doesn't smoke, yeah. it's going to look a bit odd, isn't it? That's so, right. Yeah. Um, someone once told me, I don't know if this is a myth, but. Um, because something like Saving Private Ryan is mm -hmm. a 15 and it's obviously really violent and mm -hmm. very, very graphic, but something mm -hmm. like Scream is an 18. Mm -hmm. Is it because it's more realistic and it's a, it's a war film that it's, it's, it's a lower level? Well, I think uh, Saving Private Ryan is still, shall we say, right at the top end of the 15. There was a lot, oh, it's on the cusp, uh, yeah, a lot of discussion at the board at the time that came in. I think in the end, um, a lot of weight was put on the fact that it was in a historical context and that it potentially had educational value. Also, that um, instead of glorifying violence or you know using violence purely as entertainment, it was doing it to show the horrors of war. So it was doing it for a legitimate reason. But it was definitely a decision that took a lot of thought at the time. Mm. So that can sway it because of historical accuracy, yeah. can it? Yeah, yeah. Something like Scream is obviously unrealistic. It's done, yeah. you know, or any of these horror films like Friday the Thirteenth yeah. or something like that. Yeah. But because uh, it's a war film. Yeah, and with something like um, Scream or certainly one of the Friday the Thirteenth films, the whole the whole point of the film is to show as much uh, gore and horror as you can. Mm. You know because that's what an audience who are paying to see a horror film want to see and, and that's fine no you know no, no reason not to do that but it does mean that the violence isn't being dealt with in a serious way that's trying to tell you something about violence it's it's there for entertainment yeah it's not got a subliminal yeah. message and, and, or something and often like that. those sort of um, 18 level horror films they tend to have quite a bit of sadism in them quite a bit of focus on the gore so it's not incidental it tends to be uh, um I think we're all right. Sorry about that. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, so it tends to be fairly, um, shall we say, it's, it's it's more about violence as entertainment mm. than anything else. Yeah, mm. yeah. Because yeah. I suppose, like, you know, with the beach scene at the beginning, it's not glorifying it whatsoever. No. It's just showing a historical yeah. kind of yeah. mo moment mm. there. Um, in something like uh, old TV shows, sitcoms especially, like mm. Faulty Towers, um, mm. maybe Only Fools and Horses, mm. because of the, the language you sometimes was of the time in the 70s mm. and 80s, has that been caused to reclassify certain things yes. like maybe racial things yeah, that yeah, people yeah. say I, we, we try to cut works a bit of slack if they're very dated especially if we don't think children are likely to watch them uh, because then all you're doing is you know, warning the adult viewers who are going to watch it anyway because they remember don't it need as a the, warning yeah. about it but, but in some of the more extreme cases uh, when those kind of things have come back in we have pushed the writing up um, probably the worst example is something like Love Thy Neighbour, mm. which you know really does have a lot of uh, racial uh, slurs in it. Um, and was there and, one, Until Death Is Do Part? Was that yeah, another exactly. One? And there's a lot of offensive language in there that um, might have got away with you know TV screenings in the 70s or mm. on VHS in the 1980s, but nowadays um, we can't really accept that at, at, at the PG level where it's just being. Uh, used uh, to provide entertainment yeah. and, 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 and laughs. Um, obviously, we don't mind uh, depictions of discrimination where discrimination is being criticised mm. or where it has a strong message against uh, discrimination, but those kind of um, outdated works, we tend to now pass them at least at the 12th level. Mm. It sounds the BBFC, I mean, we live in sort of quite a... Uh, where people are quite sensitive and things like that. BBC, mm. BBFC seems to be quite a fair organisation. It gives you know a lot of slack to people, not a lot of slack, but it, it mm. seems to be degrade things and do things on quite a neutral level, which I think is quite good. Yeah, is that um, something that you you felt has always been the case? Yes, I, I to an extent. I mean, obviously, I don't want to talk for people who of were at the BBFC <laughs> a very long time ago. But I, I I think the board always tries to be as objective as it can. Obviously, when you're making those boardline calls, sometimes. Um, subjective opinion has to form part of it but then again subjective opinion on the part of the viewers is going to play a part in how they respond to it as well but I think we try to stay neutral and I think nowadays the emphasis is far more on uh, putting stuff in appropriate categories rather than shall we say censoring something because it's offensive 
uh, but also providing as much information as we can. And that's why we now have the, you know, the ratings info that used to be called consumer advice that you see on the black card, um, also on you know, DVD packaging. But we also provide even more detailed information on the website. So what we're trying to do is just uh, tell, uh, tell people and especially parents as much as we can about what's in the work rather than telling them you know, what we think about it. I was, I was going to mention, because I had a look at your uh, mm. website the other day, uh, specifically we were talking about Joker, I think mm. it was, and you could see, uh, obviously, the name of the film director, mm. producers, mm. who's involved, mm. and then you have got the breakdown. I assume mm. those, these are the notes that you've just been taking down over the course of the movie. Yeah, about. it's not quite the full notes, but mm. um, when, when you get to the end of a viewing with a feature, whether it's on film or video, the compliance officer will go through their notes, they'll uh, write a short piece of text that goes on our website explaining the decision, explaining what kinds of you know violent sex language are in it. Um, normally they focus on the stuff that led to that particular classification, but there's also a section at the bottom of the information that also points out anything that might not have led to the classification but might be of interest to some viewers. So for example, if there's a suicide scene or references to self-harm, even if that wasn't part of the decision, um, we, we, we include that information on the website just so that those who um, want to know about that can, can read about it and avoid it if they want to. Mm, interesting. Um, so obviously the, the, what you do is a massive part of cinema in Britain across the world basically if somebody wanted to get involved with the BBFC or wanted to join how do they do that is it a simple application process and yes do they... um, the BBFC is actually a really small organisation we're just over 40 people and, and the people who do the viewing we've got um, 11 full time compliance officers uh, plus me and my colleague Sarah overseeing it so it's quite small and obviously because the job does involve watching, watching films all day it's it's not um, it's not a job that people tend to leave in a hurry. So vacancies <laughs> come up fairly rarely, but when the vacancies do come up, we just advertise them in the normal way uh, in the papers on our website. So yeah, uh, if people want to get involved, there's probably not a lot of point writing to us now, uh, but people can keep an eye on the job section on the website and, mm. and just apply. So it's a, a very simple application process, yeah, yeah. and well, do you have to have like sim simple application simple. processes? Perhaps underselling it. Normally, we, uh, we we ask people who apply to be viewers to write an essay for us. Um, we then interview them, and then we set up a viewing day for the for the for the last stage for the final candidates, um, where I concoct a horror show of material that they have to watch for the morning and then uh, write reports on it so that we have an opportunity not only to meet them in the interview but we also get uh, a sense of how they're going to react to material and, and how, uh, how they're going to be able to analyse it because the key point of the job is to be able to spot the things that need to be spotted mm. but then also to break them down, discuss them and analyse them. So it's quite a protracted process but um, the application form is simple. Yeah. So how many people do you employ um, because it doesn't seem you've got many, many actual staff working for the BBS. So no. It's no. quite a skeleton, so yeah, yeah, quite yeah. a small it's, group. Uh, as I said, I think we've got 11 compliance officers at the moment. We've also got a few um, former staff who can help out on a freelance basis mm -hmm. um, if we require them. But yeah, so given that we do all, all theatrical films, all DVDs, all Blu-rays, and a lot of online content, it's a... Uh, it's a fairly small staff, but they're they're all viewing, you know, five and a half hours of content every day, five days a week. And you are required to, obviously, you you said before that you occasionally watch full movies, but it's generally mm. specific scenes. Mm. But everybody has to, whoever is watching a specific mm. movie, has to watch the entire movie. Yes. Is that the case? Yeah, absolutely. So even, I mean, uh, a friend of ours mentioned the other day that somebody wants sent in a video of paint drying or something like that. Oh, yeah. I don't yeah. know if that's an urban myth. No, it's not bit. an urban no. myth, no. It was a film called Paint Drying. Um, I think the filmmaker, what he was trying to do was protest about the fact that to show something in a cinema you had to get clearance from the BBFC. And, you know, obviously his point was it's ludicrous even if there's nothing in the film that you have to pay the BBFC to watch it. So, you know, I can see where he was coming from. So he decided to do a crowdfunder mm -hmm. and he would raise money to make a film of paint drying on a wall and then force the BBFC to watch it. And however long the film was would depend on how much money he, he raised because the BBFC charges according to the duration of a film. So in the end, he got enough money from his... Uh, 
crowdfunder campaign to make a 10 hour film of paint drying. So, you know, he submitted the film to us and we watched 10 hours of paint drying. And, and some he, poor and bloke him, was just. And he got a U certificate. Wow. So, that's, you know, so wow. if you submit another film, will you, will you be like, that's not my job? That's not my job. To well, you know, that. to be honest, people, you know, part of the concept was that he, he thought it would really irritate us. Um, I mean, I have to say it didn't really, because normally you're watching a film and, and you're having to note down all kinds of stuff and it's quite busy. You it's know, just not looking out the window, really, yeah, isn't it? It's not, know, it's not you a just great... kick back and watch paint drying yeah. for 10 hours. It's not really that big a problem. It's, wow. it's probably better than some of you know some other films you can yeah. watch. With the rise of streaming services and people can release their mm. own content on YouTube and things like that, is mm. that something you have to look into? Look like short films now. I think I've got a short yeah. film I did a couple of years ago that were going to Amazon now. Mm -hmm. Will that have to go to the BBFC and be and be rated? Yeah, legally speaking, it doesn't. Um, a lot of uh, VOD and streaming platforms work with us on a voluntary basis. Mm. Uh, Netflix and, and Amazon also submit content to us to view. But they don't need to. They don't have to. They, they do it because um, it gives reassurance to their customers that it's been properly regulated and that independent and impartial information is available. And I think it also helps that the BBFC has been around for so long and our classifications are so well known in the UK that it gives a good sense to their customers of, uh, you know, if this is a 12 and it's a BBFC 12, I've got a good idea what's going to be in it. And, and they also use the, you know, the extra ratings info that we, uh, that we issue them with. Um, when it comes to stuff like user-generated content on YouTube, you know, realistically, it's not possible to deal with that given the, uh, the amount of yeah. stuff that's out there, you know, us <coughs> watching... Uh, you know, hours and hours of you know people doing silly things, or, or you know, dogs and it's impossible or, to be pointless. You, it? It, it, yeah, no, you you just can't do it. Um, what we do do is talk to those kind of platforms about whether there are, there are ways that we can assist them in setting up ways where uh, content creators can self-rate their stuff, and then maybe there can be crowd writing. You know, to flag up if there's any any problems with material. But it is a uh, is something that's not covered currently by legislation, and for obvious practical reasons, it's it's quite hard to do anything about it in quite the way that we do with uh, cinema and DVD. But certainly, the you know streaming services we are working increasingly with. Have you seen a, a difference in attitude only just over the last ten years, and what people are accepting, and you know like complaints you might get? Have you seen that change recently, or is it something? That is uh, over a much longer period of time. Yeah, it doesn't tend to change that quickly, but sort of over a 10-year period, uh, as, uh, as we said earlier, there's more and more concern about discrimination. Uh, that's definitely been uh, one element. More concern about sexual violence, not to say there wasn't concern, but increased concern. And also an increasing feeling, especially amongst young people, that they're, um, they're more concerned by stuff that has a real-world setting or context or something they can associate with so if it's something like um, self-harming suicide mental health something mental like that. Yeah. health issues those kind of things they're more sensitive about it not necessarily they want us to classify things differently or certainly not censor stuff but they want to be informed about it so that they can avoid that kind of stuff so I think there's more sensitivity on those kind of issues whereas we'd probably get um, less feedback and fewer complaints about the more traditional issues like uh, violence and sex. Mm. Right. Okay. Um, I, th I think we are coming up towards the end of our time, so we've got a few closing questions, mm -hmm. if you don't mind me asking. Um, sure. Or us asking, I should say, mm -hmm. myself. Yeah. Um, now, I don't know if this question is defunct for you or it's going to be really, really bad for you, but basically, mm -hmm. are there any questions, and everybody has their movies that they're a bit ashamed they haven't watched uh, over their time? Obviously, mm -hmm. as head of compliance, you probably watched everything you ever need to watch but is there anything where you're like I still haven't watched Stanley Kubrick's 2001 or something like that no I think I've seen all his films mm. Charlie, even Charlie Fear and him. Desire so yeah. um, I'll remain silent on the Stanley Kubrick <laughs> front I, 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 I'm missing some of them and it is shameful on my no, part no I can't off the top of my head think of something that I feel I must catch up with um no, sorry. What about TV shows? You uh, do you like TV shows as much as films, or um, the TV stuff I watch tends to be the stuff that comes in for DVD okay. release. Okay. Um, in terms of actually watching TV, I have to admit that mm. uh, for me, coming home in the evening and you know watching a screen is is a bit of a push <laughs> unless it's something I really need to see. So I'm I'm probably not 
as big a TV fan as a film fan. Okay. So you're a big book reader by the end of the day or something? Yeah, a lot of, a lot of book reading. Yeah. It's nice to go to the theatre at the weekend, yeah. that kind of stuff, just for a break. But, Very good. Well, on the flip side of that question mm. then, is there anything that you feel more people should have watched? Or um, is there a film that you would say everyone should watch? Like, this is the movie that uh, has changed the way I see cinema, the way I see my life, I don't know, touched you. Defined a generation or something like that. Yeah. Wow. Um, well, one film, I, I, I think I've mentioned this um, to other people, one film I always say people should see, and, and perhaps not as many people have seen as, as I would like, is uh, Come and See. Do you know that? The, uh, no. Oh, okay. Well, good. So you can go and yeah, check that yeah, one out. Yeah, it's, um, it's a 1980s, I think 1985 Soviet war film set, set during the Second World War, and it is just incredibly powerful and impactful. And I always say to people that they should check that out. It's a pretty grueling and harrowing experience, but just from the way that the film is shot. I think I've heard of it, it's, yeah. It's uh, you know, yeah. shot from sort of first-person perspective, wow. and it is, um, it's incredibly powerful and impactful. And again, you know, talking about violence and a film uh, telling the truth about violence rather than sensationalising it or exploiting it, this is definitely a film that tells you why uh, violence and war are bad. It's uh, it's definitely worth seeing. And that the first time I saw that, I was absolutely knocked for six by. And is that an English film? Is it or no, is it a, it's a Russian foreign film, film? Russian film from the eighties, but it is available on DVD. But mm. that's um, that's a film that's worth checking out. Otherwise, okay. recent releases and that I have to be a bit careful about not being seen to be yeah. promoting a film from one that studio. Makes sense. So uh, yeah, I, I will remain silent on the current crop of films. Okay. Fair enough. Well. Um, Thank you very much for joining I us. I think that's everything. Thanks so much, Craig. Right. Thanks for coming. Right.